Boom, what is up guys? Welcome back to another video and to another weekly devotional on the YouTube channel, number 61 to be exact. Excited for what the Lord has in store for us. And let's just jump right in. If you have a Bible, start turning over to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. We're going to land in verse number 14, which is a very familiar text and verse in Scripture. But I will give some prior context. I'll start in verse 12 and read through verse 14. And I'll just briefly share what the Lord's laid on my heart, and then I'll get out of the way. But 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse number 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So often we've grown up in church hearing this verse, and it is truly kind of the blueprint for revival. I believe Second Chronicles 7.14, you can follow it step by step, and I don't want to spoil too much for the latter part of this devotional, but you can truly go through and follow each step and each comma doing each of these things in verse number 14. And if you do, the promise that we find at the end of verse number 14, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is a promise from the Lord that if you do these things, you will have revival, not just individually, but corporately. But what we have here, this entire chapter leading up to verse 14, is quite interesting, especially when you look at what has just happened in the life of Solomon and the people, and then look at this kind of warning and precaution and blueprint that God gives in verse number 14. If you were to study this chapter in its entirety, and if you were to look through verses 1 through 11, there almost is kind of a, I wouldn't say a revival, but certainly a wonderful time of worship and praise with the Lord. Solomon and the people, they go to the temple. God's glory comes down. It says a fire came down from heaven in verse number one. It consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. The glory of the Lord filled the house. And this glory is so magnificent and so great that the priests couldn't even enter into the house of the Lord. The people are praising. The people are shouting. The people are worshiping. He is good. His mercy endureth forever. And even the people have such a heart of offering and willingness to give sacrifice. The Bible says in verse number 5, reading down through, that King Solomon, he offered 20 and 2,000 oxen. So 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. And they offer all these animals fully fed, fully healthy, fully ready to be sacrificed, all to the Lord and all to God. And this offering, this sacrifice, his heart, um, their hearts were so great and so full, and this time was so precious and precious and jubilant and joyful that the Bible says in verse number seven, moreover Solomon howled the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for he offered burnt offerings, the fat of the peace offerings, because the brass and altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive them. So what they had to do is they had to move from the altar they had originally made all of a sudden, to the middle of the court, this new place of sacrifice, this new offering spot, if you will, because what they had offered was so great. Not only were all these people here, not only were they all ready to worship the Lord, and they were bowing down and praising Him, but they had such a heart to give that they gave so much and were willing to give so much that they literally had to move places and expand their place of worship to somewhere bigger. And so this is a wonderful time. Fire is coming down from heaven. The heavens are opened up. People are worshiping. People are praising. This is an exciting time. But then we get down to verse number 12. And I wanted to give all that. I wanted to mention all that context because for us as readers, we read that. And I see no problem in that whatsoever. I see no issue. I see no difficulties and even a need for, for a precaution. They just had, for all intents and purposes, a really wonderful church service. Everybody was worshiping. The Lord met with them. God was 
sending down fire. He was um, accepting their offerings. And they were offering all that they had and continued to do so. But then in verse number 12, after a long day of worship and praise, Solomon gets into his bed. And the Lord appears to him in a dream, appeared to Solomon by night. And this is kind of the warning, but also the blueprint that he gives. I've heard thy prayer, verse 12. I've heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. And then in verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The reason why God gives Solomon this warning and even this blueprint for revival is because he knew the condition of their hearts, not only now, but he knew it in the future. He knew that one day the children would wander, they would practice idolatry, they'd start to live and dwell in their own sin, their own pride, their own greed, and they would eventually go into exile for, the Bible says, 70 years taking them that entire time span, a generation's worth, 70 years to do what verse number 14 says before the Lord was able to deliver them and bring them back into the land to build the temple back after it got burned down and destroyed and the people got brought back from captivity. They would eventually, not now, but God knew, God was in the future, God knew what was going to happen. He knew that it would take them, they would go into exile due to their sin. They would spend 70 years in bondage and in captivity and then 70 years of waiting and of desperation, they would finally humble themselves. They would finally pray. They'd finally seek the Lord's face and turn from their wicked ways, which at that point, the Lord, we know, brings them back into the land and restores the temple and starts to restore some of the aspects of their life that they previously thought to be. But enough context, enough background, just briefly, I just kind of want to go through this text, verse number 14, and just kind of show for us as believers that this is the blueprint of revival. And if we want there to be a difference in our own heart, if we want our country to turn its eyes and its ways back to the Lord Jesus, we need to follow what we find in verse number 14. Firstly, we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. That's kind of the first thing I want to note. I think this is an interesting distinction to make because we see that the word repentance or even turning from their sin isn't mentioned until the last part of this verse. So why in the world would repentance come after humbling? Well, oftentimes for many people, they never go down to the altar. They never lay that Isaac down. They never get right or get serious for the Lord Jesus Christ because they simply won't humble themselves. They're... they're too full of pride and too full of arrogance and jealousy and um, self-centeredness that they don't want other people to think lesser of them or think differently of them if they were to go down to an altar and get right. And so God lays this blueprint, not just for the people then, but for us today, that we have to humble ourselves. We have to get desperate. We don't need to think morally or more highly of what we ought to of ourselves. We need to humble ourselves. We need to understand that this humbling is step one in the process and that the only true key for revival is understanding that it's not through us, but it's only through the Lord. We have to depend on Him, and we have to not be too arrogant or too puffed up, and we have to lay down our pride. We have to beset our jealousy and our self-centeredness, our narcissisms. We have to do that if we want the Lord to truly do something for ourselves and for our country. Secondly, though, we have to pray. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but we have to to pray. We have to be willing to have that communion with God. We have to be willing to enter into his presence, enter into that throne room to lay things down, to get serious, to get right. And oftentimes a part of humbling ourselves is praying and getting down on our hands and knees, getting down into that place of full surrender and full totality before the Lord and full desperation, humbling ourselves, but then praying and asking God to do great things and to revive the individual, to, to revive our country, to fix our government, for the country to turn its eyes back on Jesus, for him to truly do something that only he can do. It comes through humbling and it comes through prayer. But also, number three, we have to seek the Lord's face. 
And I like this distinction because seeking the Lord's face is not just a one-time thing. It is a lifestyle. Seeking the face of God is something you do every single day. Yes, you can do it through prayer. Yes, you can do it through the spiritual disciplines. But it is something you do with your life. I hope that is your desire. I hope that's your plea this evening that your life would be one that continually seeks the face of God, that seeks his approval, that seeks his um, stamp of approval, as people say, that would have his joy, that would have reverence brought to him through your actions and through what you say and through what you do. That the glory and the majesty and the grace and mercy of God would be shown through what you do in your day-to-day -day life. I hope that you want to seek his face and I hope that in all decisions, big and small, and especially as it pertains to something as great as revival, that you would seek his face and come to that place of humbling and of desperation before him. So yes, we see you need to humble yourselves. Yes, you need to pray. You need to seek his face. But finally, number four, you need to turn from your wicked ways. Turning from your wicked ways. So often I see people say that they want to change, say that they don't want sin to marinate and to fester up in their life anymore. And they say, God, I'm laying this down. Lord, I'm, they, they go to an altar or even in their private time in that prayer closet, they get on their hands and knees, they weep, they sob, they cry out before God, they make the, um, the steps down, they make the venture to the altar, they lay it down, but then they get up from the altar and then a couple days or weeks later, they're back living and indwelling in the same sin that they asked God to deliver them from just days and weeks prior. Turning from your wicked ways, yes, is laying those things down and asking God to forgive you and giving those things up to him. But if you're going to remove something in your life, you also have to add something in your life. You see, this is something that if I could go back to when I was just a teenager, 12, 13, 14 years old, that's something I would really like to just sit there and beat into the brain of my early teenage year self. Because so often, and not just even spiritual things, but even in just things in general, I thought I could just remove something in my life and be okay. But the truth is that never actually produced long-lasting and genuine fruit in my life because I'd remove something but never replace it with something good. I'd remove the bad thing but never replace it with a good thing. And so ultimately that hole that is now created in my life as a result of removing that sin or removing that bad person or that bad friend group, it's still there. And I'd eventually go back to it because it was never replaced with something fruitful and beneficial to myself. So you have to turn from your wicked ways. It is a 180 degree turn. And I'm afraid for most people today, this is one of the points they get hung up on the most. You want revival. You want God to do something in yourself. You want God to save that friend or family member. You want him to revive your family. You want him to revive your church. You want him to revive the great country we live in, the United States of America. But you're not willing to truly turn from your wicked ways 180 degrees and solely pursue after him, not looking back at what you had previously just laid down. But we find here in verse number 14 so clearly and so evidently that if we do these things, God will, he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. And I believe in the times we're living in today, especially coming up in this next season of elections and how important and how vital, vital these next couple months are for the future of our country. I believe we need to get real. We need to get desperate and we need to follow the blueprint in this outline in verse number 14. And we need to do this and in faith believing, expecting God to do something and to send revival to ourselves. Because it's, revival starts with us. It starts with us falling and back, falling back in love with the Lord Jesus. It starts with the individual. But for him to send revival to us, to our groups, to our churches, to America, and to this world. Because we're in a bad place. Sin has taken over and wreaked havoc like never thought possible before. But there still is hope, and there's a plan that we find in an outline, a plan for revival. And we as God's people need to get desperate and start getting serious before a three times holy God. That's all I have. That's my heart. That's my burden. I pray that that's your heart and your desire as well. 
Um, wherever you're at, young, old, in your Christian walk, I pray that you seek this as much as I solely do and I want to see on behalf of myself and my family and my country because we need it and we need it more than ever before. But that's all. I'm going to close this in a time of prayer and that will be it. So let us pray. Holy Father, in Jesus' name, God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your precious word. And God, the clear blueprint that we find for revival in Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. God, I thank you that this verse and this plan is not only applicable for the people then, before they got into exile and even once they got out of it, but God, it's applicable for us as people now. And God, I pray that you'd help us, God, raise up a generation, raise up a group of people, raise up some preachers, some missionaries, God, some pastor's wives, some businessmen, some teachers, some people with power, some people in the government, people with influence. God, raise up a, a people that, God, that would be desperate, that, God, we could turn to you, that, we, God, we could humble ourselves, seek you, God, turn from our sin, God, in order to see revival come to ourselves and to our country, which so desperately needs it, God, in the times that we're living in. Just like the old hymn says, God, I pray you'd help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look to your wonderful face. God, we need you. God, we can't do it alone. God, I pray that you give us the boldness, the sincerity of heart to do such. And God, help us in these times. And God, I pray that if we do these things, that God, you would, in faith believing, though, God, you would and you will send revival and make a change in our country today. God, we love you. Help us this week, God inject and help us to marinate on this verse and these words of her today god help us to follow after them and god i pray that you'd help us to seek you all the days of our life and it's in your name we pray amen amen so that's all for another video be sure to like comment and subscribe and i'll see you all on thursday god bless